please take out your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, as we continue with our study and this wonderful text that uh, the Apostle John wrote for us. In John chapter 3, we will read for you the verses 8 to 16. This is the word of the living God. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, you are the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, and you do not accept our witness. If I told you earthly things and you did not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of God, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your word that provides light, clarity, and purpose for our journey here. Because life begun here on this planet for us, but it will end in heaven. We thank you for your truths. May you give us clarity of thought and mind, and may your word be explained, and may we grasp the lesson here being taught. We thank you, we praise you, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our text this morning, our title for today is uh, The Teacher Meets the Master. The teacher meets the master. It is wonderful as teachers when you teach something and see your student understand it and they go on and they do greater things than the teacher. Uh, but this is not going to happen here today. <laughs> uh, because there can be no one that can improve on what Jesus uh, taught and what he has done. But we have done greater things than he did, meaning in quantity by preaching the gospel to more places than he, he did. So yes, we've done some things in that, in that sense. But as we come to our text this morning, we, we, uh, Thomas Watson, one of the Puritan writes, quote, if we put Christ off with delays and excuses, perhaps he will come no more. He will live off persuading his spirit shall no longer strive. And then poor sinner, what will you do? When God's uplifting ends, your woes begin, end of quote. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So this morning we come to the most popular verse in the Bible. Sadly, we live in a culture in which familiarity breeds contempt. Furthermore, just because this verse is popular, it does not mean that it is obeyed. Our text continues with a teachable moment between Jesus and the teacher in Israel. Nicodemus had everything going for him. He was educated, respected, and achieved the highest religious level in Judaism. He was the top teacher. No one was higher. He had the last word in all discussions. Again, keep in mind. His decision was final and he wasn't challenged. That is only for a time. <clears throat> because when they wanted to kill Jesus, you will see this here this morning. Things changed. Nicodemus' names means victory. He had the right pedigree, credentials, reputation, and success. Yet, Nicodemus was void of peace. He was empty inside. He was looking for satisfaction, gratification, consolation, and resolution. And this brings us to our three points we will be discussing this morning here, the Messiah of God, the salvation of God, and the teaching of God. Now let's look at the Messiah of God. 
The text says Nicodemus came at night to Jesus. Who met whom? Was it really Nicodemus who met Jesus or Jesus met Nicodemus? You must have your theology right here. <laughs> Nicodemus was lost. He was lost. Meaning he was empty, he was spiritually dead. So who found him? Whom? Nicodemus was found by Jesus. Why? How can you say that? Well, when did Jesus know Nicodemus? In eternity past. That night, the same day with the woman at the well. The scripture tells us Jesus had to go to Samaria. What do you mean Jesus had to go? He didn't need to go. He's God. He doesn't need to do anything. But because there was a soul and a balance, he went. It's the same thing here in our text this morning. Nicodemus comes at night, but it was the Holy Spirit of God who was beckoning Nicodemus to come. He was telling him, you need to go. So he comes. So when you, you when, when understand the sovereignty of God in the text of scripture, it wasn't Nicodemus who decided to follow Jesus. We sing this song and it's theologically incorrect. You cannot decide to follow Jesus. You are spiritually dead. When, when was the last time you were at a funeral? The coffin is open. In some cases, in most cases, it's closed. What can the dead person do? If one of them got up, what would you do? <laughs> Most of you would make a new door here. <laughs> because you wouldn't stick around. Because it is not supposed to happen. It's the same way. People are spiritually dead. They cannot decide to follow Jesus. I know, but the, the, when the author wrote that song, I got to give him credit. That's not what uh, he meant. There was a different perspective. And, but the culture had changed that. But let's still go back to Nicodemus. Why is Jesus seeking Nicodemus? Because God always seeks the sinner. Because the sinner is unwilling, unable, and incapable to seek God. God, the Holy Spirit, is the agent that goes through the process of salvation. He is the initiator of salvation. Jesus sought Nicodemus because Nicodemus came, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Jesus knew him in eternity past. So that night, it was for Nicodemus, it was by divine appointment that he came to meet with Jesus. Why? Because Nicodemus had no peace. He saw the works that Christ was doing. And as the top religious leader, he realizes he's on the wrong side of this. He's not involved with him. If he's not involved with him and he's doing all these good things, and they concluded the Sanhedrin 70 plus him, 71, and he was the, the last person to see. If they concluded the works that you do, you must be from God. If he's from God and I'm not with him, where did that put me? It's not, this is a smart man. Where does that leave me? I'm in the wrong camp. I'm the one playing for the wrong team. I need to be on his side. So he come to Jesus. He comes to Jesus. So with all his knowledge and religious experiences, he was convinced that his soul was in the balance and that if he died, he would go to hell. So he came to Jesus. <laughs> what about you? Do you have the peace of God? If not, you need to do the same. You need to come to Jesus. See, Nicodemus, he, he came seeking and hoping and inquiring about eternal life. Again, the question that is not in the text, but the main question here, what must I do to be saved? Now is the acceptable time. Now, today is the day of grace. Not tomorrow, not later. Now is the acceptable time. What about you? What will you do with 
Jesus? This is a question everyone has to answer. Everyone has to answer. As we continue in our text, we see in verse 7, do not be amazed that I say to you that you must be born again. In other words, you must be born from above. As we expounded on this last week, well, I'm not, I don't have time to go back to all that, but if you want more, more, you could go on YouTube and the message is there. You can, can look at the last one. But what we need to see here, that day, Nicodemus, Jesus placed Nicodemus in to a point where he had to decide, do I follow Christ or do I go to hell? When you witness to someone, you must put them on where they have to make a decision. Don't put, you put, you tell them they must make a decision and leave them that they deal with God. Scripture tells us, I put life and death before you. Choose life. Tell them what the best choice is. Because he met with Jesus, Nicodemus will never be the same. Beloved, when you meet with Jesus, you can never, never, ever be the same. You're either going to become a believer or you are doomed in hell forever. These are the two options. These are the choices, heaven or hell. This is why you must be born again. The story is told of a lady and when George uh, uh, Whitfield was preaching and he kept telling people, you must be born again. So after the message, she went to ask George, hey, listen, why do you keep telling people they must be born again? And his answer is classic. He said, madam, because you must be born again. <laughs> what else could you add to that? Again, be sure, be very sure that you were born again. Don't tell me you go to church. I met a lot of people who go to church. And I don't mean they are born again. There are people who say, well, I do X, Y, and Z in a church. That's not the answer. Oh, you born from above. Do you have a new heart? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? If not, you need to repent. You need to run to him. You need to come to him. When you look at verse 8 here, then Jesus continued to expound. He tells them that the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sounds, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is for everyone who is born of the Spirit. What is Jesus saying here? The wind is controlled by whom? God. We see, we don't know where it's going. We see and appreciate the, the, the effect of the wind. This is the same thing with the Holy Spirit. We don't know where the Holy Spirit is coming from or, or what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing in your hearts right now. We don't know what he's doing in the heart of the unbeliever either. But guess what? We will see the good works that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Because guess what? When you come to Christ, you're not going to stay stagnant. You're not going to stay the same. You're going to grow. You're going to do the good works God has for ordained for you before the foundation of the world. And you will do these good works. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We don't see. Sometimes you make a decision and you look back and you say, Lord, thank you for making that decision 15 years ago because that was the best choice. Back then, the Holy Spirit led you. He knows all true. He knows what's best for you. And he propelled you to go make this decision versus that one. And when you're a child of his, he's going to work out all things. And that's the verse that boggles the mind. He's going to work out all things for our good. And for his ultimate glory. He knows what's best. So we cannot control the wind. It's the same thing. We cannot control the spirit of God. Human beings cannot control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does as he pleases. He does what is right because he sees. He knows the future. He knows what's best for us. See, when the Holy Spirit is at work, we will testify that God has done great things. Why? Because the result will be evident. The one who is born again has a new life, a new way of thinking, and new desires to please God. The one who is born from above loves their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
They have new interest because salvation is the work of God and is made evident in Matthew 5, 16. And, you know, so let our light so shine, they may see our what? Our good works. Why are we doing good works? Because he foreordained them. He created them for you to walk. You got your own path that you are walking on. I can't worry about what others are doing. All I'm going to be concerned is the path that I'm on and I must do the good works he foreordained for me and before the foundation of the world. And when you do them, guess what? Others see the good works. Who did they give glory to? Not you. When they try to bring it to you, defer it because you deserve all of it. And that brings us to our next point here, the salvation of God. See, we talked about the Messiah of God. Now we see the salvation of God. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, by scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. These are the five solas that went... We, change the world, if you will, with the Reformation. Salvation, according to Titus chapter 2, verse 13, tells us it is the blessed hope in the appearing of, uh, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's salvation. He came. And believe me, if he didn't come, what would we be today? There is only one way to be saved. That is through the finished work of Jesus Christ. This salvation of Jesus Christ is so rich and pure that God declared we have been justified. We have been made right with God. We have been redeemed, saved. Now we are forgiven. We are loved, regenerated, set free in Christ from the penalty, first, from the penalty of sin. Second, the consequences of sin. And lastly, but most importantly, soon and very soon, from the very presence of sin. That is salvation. If someone doesn't have that, they are not saved. Salvation is being saved from the wrath of God to come. Because at some point in time, God will unleash his wrath on the wicked in hell. It is being saved now and from all eternity. Because when salvation has entered your heart, you are saved, secure. You are kept. And God will bring you home. Oh, this is so important. This is so important. You know, we see... The U.S. military had a, had a motto, we bring all our men and women home, dead or alive. But at times, there's, they've forgotten some men. Talk to those who went to Vietnam. But you gotta understand this, there is no way, no how that Jesus Christ is gonna leave one particle of your ashes on this planet. All of it will be transformed and it's gonna bring you home because he paid in full for your death and mine. That's salvation. So one must believe, one must repent the gospel while one is alive because after death it is too late one's condition is fixed at death this author writes quote you can bury the man but you cannot bury his sins his sins will follow him and he will be judged accordingly end of quote as you heard me say uh, at some point in time we say that oh, god loves the sinner but hate the sin but understand it's, it is not the sin that is god to send in hell it is the sinner who is, will be in hell forever and forever no one can be made right with god after death if you died in your sin it is too late it is too late that salvation that god provides was decided in heaven that salvation came down to earth it is from above you must believe that gospel to be forgiven of your sin you must confess jesus as lord you must trust in the saving work of christ see so far i didn't tell anybody that they must pray a prayer and walk down a light and write your name on a piece of paper to be saved because you can't find one of those verses one one of those things in scripture you just can't 
But to be saved, you must repent. You must believe the gospel. You must engage the mind. You must engage the will. Make them see scripture. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Go to Romans chapter 10 with them. Explain that. You need more information than that. I'll gladly give you some because you went to that course there over the summer and early fall. Can give you information on that. How do you present the gospel? Again, at some point in time, the sinner must agree. Whoa, I'm a sinner. They got to feel like they must have a Nicodemus moment. If he's doing the work of God, then whose work am I doing? I'm not in the same camp with him. Because the rest of these people, they want to kill him. And I'm part of them. And he's doing the work of God. What does that, where does that leave me? You must agree with God that you are sinful. Additionally, you, you must repent. You must believe the gospel. This view of biblical salvation is all of God. And the sinner must be informed that if they continue in the faith, the spirit of God will confirm this. to their spirit they are children of God. When someone make a profession of faith, don't tell them you save, you're on your way to heaven. No, you tell them if you continue in the faith. Because when you tell them now, okay, you're not, you save, you're on your way to heaven. And two weeks later, you're looking for them, you can find them and they're doing the same old things that they were doing. And all of people will say, oh, they lost their salvation. That's where people run into trouble. Now they can defend the fact they told this person they were saved now, they're not in Christ anymore. What? Oh, you mean to tell me God had you in the palm of his hand and God lost you? God had you written your name in his hands and now he can't bring you home. You have to be careful with your theology. Because all those, all those names were written in heaven before the foundation of the world. All he would say. And when he died on the cross, Jesus Christ, your name was on his mind. Your name was written on his hands. And because he knows you, he's going to bring you home. Jesus leaves no Christian behind. You cannot lose your salvation. You were never a Christian. That's why you did what you did. You put on a show for somebody, but you were not saved. If you were, if you were saved, you would continue in the faith. That's what salvation is. If you are saved, you continue in the faith. Please don't give people false hope, please. Now, after such an elaborate explanation, what was the answer to this heavenly view of salvation by the greatest, given to the greatest teacher in Israel? Look at verse nine. <laughs> How can these things be? <laughs> you know, when you take, you know, as you teach, sometimes students have questions. And when you explain something, they should understand and they'll come back at you with, I don't get it. And it's like, wait a minute. Then for a moment there, you're thinking, okay, did I use language above their intellectual abilities? Where did I go wrong here? Nicodemus is, could not understand. Why is, is it he could not understand this? Let's dig deeper. The religion of his day, Judaism taught that salvation was by works. If, it's a if and then clause, if you do this, then you will be saved. Oh, wait a minute. That's a false religion. What must I do to be saved? Believe. So what work do you do? Absolutely nothing. The faith that you have, God gives it to you but you are still responsible to believe. Let me explain. They had a work-based salvation. When you look at Romans chapter 10, verses two and three, and this is why Paul makes, makes this clear for us. In Romans chapter 10, verses two and three, for I testify about them that they, meaning the Jews, had a zeal for God. They were all excited about God. They wanted to do God's work. They had a zeal. They wanted to do what was right. However, 
but not according to knowledge. This is when the falter. What, what do you mean? Not according to knowledge. For not knowing about the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So in other words, we're going to go to heaven, but we're going to make our own way to get there. Can anyone get to heaven that way? The answer is a resounding no. That's what the Jews wanted to do. A work-based salvation. This is why the woman came and gave her last two pennies on the thing. Because if you give, then God is compelled to bless you. No, you give because you love God. The very breath you're taking right now is because God gave it to you. Otherwise, you would need oxygen to breathe. So we give because we love it. So the point here is to be right, to be made right with God, you cannot do this because we are sinners. Again, we are spiritually dead. The dead cannot give God anything. It must be giving to them. You need someone greater than you to help you in your situation. See, the Jews had, got it, had it wrong. Salvation for them was through their own effort that they will be saved. They wanted a work salvation to their own means. They wanted to do this by their own bootstraps. Simply stated, they had a Frank Sinatra complex. We did this our way. Can anyone get to heaven that way? No. And still, many religion in the world still teach that salvation is a work-based salvation. Such salvation is powerless to save anyone. What about true Christianity? In true Christianity, it is all done. Meaning what? Paid in full. It is by grace alone, because we are saved by grace alone, through faith, al faith alone, and it is not of ourselves. It is in Christ alone. Why is that? Because it's a gift of God. But why? So no man can boast. Imagine if you could say, be saved by your own self. People would start comparing themselves among themselves. I got saved better than you. Because you don't understand. I was in church when I got saved. Oh, no. I got saved when I was in a bar. I got saved when I was in homosexuality. I Give me a break. It wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop. And this is why it's, about, it's by grace alone, to faith alone, and Christ alone for the glory of God alone. So no man, no woman, no boy, no girl can boast. So what do we do with Frank Sinatra? We throw that uh, CD out the window. We don't need it anymore. Throw it out the window. No one can boast. Get rid of your self-sufficiency complex because you cannot save yourself. We need to turn to Christ alone to save you from your sin and this sinful generation. To be saved is impossible. Do you understand? A dead, spiritually dead person cannot save themselves. And that was our condition before Christ. To be saved is impossible. It is impossible with men. But God is the God of the impossible. God has done a great thing when he saved you. He saved you, meaning God did the impossible by bringing you from the dead and he gave you eternal life in Christ. Look at verse 10. And in verse 10, Jesus said, are you the teacher in Israel? You do not understand these things? Jesus is not going to uh, uh, let Nicodemus slide or get away with, with a false, uh, uh, such a false understanding. This is basics, but he doesn't get it. And, and you don't understand this? How was Abraham saved? By faith. How was David saved? By faith. The saints of the Old Testament, how were they saved? By faith. Acts 17, verse 30. Therefore, having overlooked the time of ignorance, God is now commending men that everyone everywhere should repent. Men everywhere to repent. How are the saints of the New Testament saved? How are we saved? By faith. 
in verse 31, because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he determined, having furnished proof for all by raising him from the dead. So Old Testament, New Testament saints are saved by grace through faith in Christ. How? By the cross, because the cross is the dividing factor that brings Old Testament and New Testament saints home. The cross will always lead you home because they look at the cross back in the day into the future to get their salvation. And we look back at the same cross and there we find peace. There we find salvation because it is in Christ we find such magnificent salvation without which no man will see God. So Jesus take Nicodemus deeper because he should be able to handle simple theology 101, understanding verses 1, 11, and 12. Again, when you look at the text, you see that the word believe, the verb is used at least seven times here in this chapter. This is the true significance of salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith, not from men, not a religion. It is of God, by God, and for the glory of God. The sinner must repent and believe. Believe what? Believe what Jesus said about himself. Not traditions, not one's false conception or presupposed understanding of the word, not what you want the scripture to say, but when God spoke, you have to get this, when God spoke, he did not hide his thoughts. He clearly stated his principles. His law is pure and perfect. And looking at verse 11, I've told you earthly things. I came down to your level to make, the, make you understand what I'm saying to you, but you did not believe. How would you believe if I begin talking about where I come from? Heavenly things. See, Jesus is bringing the point home. He's closing the case as a superb lawyer who have argued his case and is bringing the, his submission. Beloved, the reason why most people, most people do not love God, his word, and want to be saved, one word, unbelief. It's simply unbelief. See, belief is used against twice in this sentence. It has been said that unbelief is the cause of ignorance. Unbelief is the cause of ignorance. The word of Hosea the prophet in chapter 4 verse 6 reminds us, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Why? Because they have rejected knowledge. If and when you reject knowledge, you will come to a point when you will do what is right in your own eyes. And this culture has come to that point. And at some point in time, then God remove his grace from you. And lastly, what happened to you? You fall into Romans 1. Now you have a reprobate mind. This is the result of the judgment of God on a country, a nation, a people. What was Nicodemus' problem? His problem was unbelief, his inability to grasp Jesus' word. It was not his lack of intellectual capacity, rather his failure to believe Jesus' testimony. Sadly, it was not just him. The Sanhedrin failed miserably to believe Jesus' testimony, as stated in verse 11, as well as the people. You heard the saying, like people, like priests. Equally important, the man of God speaks for God and is ordained of God. Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven. <laughs> now, when you come to this passage of scripture, you, you, you got to slow down. In verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven. See, this verse should, be, should put most of the TV evangelists out of business who claim they had a vision, they saw Jesus, or they, or they went to heaven, or God told them, all these false teachers are liars, simply because of what Jesus is telling us here. Jesus clearly argues, no one has ever been to heaven. Also, all religious leaders or system who claim that they had a special revelation from God are lying. Jesus sternly defend the fact that no one went up to heaven and returned and were able to talk about what they saw. Now you hear about 
near death experiences. And people survive and they write books about the moment, what they saw after. W would you like me to save you some money this morning? Well, I'll do it anyway. Don't buy the book. Why? It's all a lie. It's all a lie. Because no one has ascended into heaven and were able to see and come back and talk about what they saw. Why? Two points. The authors of these books all have different views of heaven. They contradict themselves. If you came to my house, all at different times, would your description of my house be different? No, my house is my house. These guys, when they write their views of heaven, they are all different. So they contradict themselves. So that has to be false. Because second, scripture just told us they never had such experience because clearly no one has ascended, has gone up to heaven and come back and able to talk about it. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, what about Paul? What about Paul? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about that. Paul writes about this. It was, it is necessary to boast, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to vision and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, that's the way of describing himself. That's the way of describing himself. He didn't want to put, hey, I, did, I went up. Whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know. He couldn't tell. He just could not tell whether how he went up into the third heaven, that experience. But he goes on to say, but God knows. But such a man was caught up under heaven, under third heaven, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or part or from the body, I do not know, God knows, was cut up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man, this is, now this is important, which a man is what? Is what? Not permitted to speak. So it's forbidden. Those of you who raise children, you understand this, right? You tell little Johnny here, don't do this. Does he have a license to go tell his friends? No. Did Paul talk about it? No. He simply mentioned it. So who gave these guys the right to come back after they saw what they saw to come and write a book about it? It wasn't God. Why? God is not the author of confusion. So as we continue in our text, Jesus' argument is, I am from above, but you're from below. I came down. Heaven is my home. Before coming to earth, no one ever had such experience. Therefore, I know the way. I am the truth, and I have the life. Therefore, Nicodemus, you should not only listen, you must also believe my words, because my words are life. I am the one who knows all things, and I am telling you these things for your own benefit. If you listen to me, you will have life, but if you reject it, you will get the other side, which is death. This morning we talked about the Messiah of God, the salvation of God, and now for our final point, the teaching of God. Why teach? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And these things that you have heard from me and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Also give you other references here as well. When one teaches, one refutes, rebukes, correct, confront, exhort, encourages, exhort, provides clarity by teaching. Teaching is essential because in this text, Jesus confronts Nicodemus's flawed theology, theological understanding about salvation and his unbelief, and he makes it plain for him to understand. This is why you teach. You take scripture, you break it down so people are able to digest what is being taught. In verse 14 now, Jesus correct Nicodemus' prior knowledge with new information. As the teacher in Israel, he should recall such a story. 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, referenced in 2 Kings 18, what was the end result of that? The people were healed when they looked at what? The serpent, and they were saved from death. So why is Jesus bringing that up? Because Jesus is connecting what you should know because he's going to add new information. You connect to what they know uh, and you connect it to new information so that you can have a greater understanding. Jesus gave this illustration. This is a prediction of how he would die. Also, the same way all who look at the serpent were physically made well. The same way all who would look on, on Jesus on the finished work on the cross and believe in him, repent of their sin, they will be made well spiritually. Wow. <laughs> this is the difference between the teacher and the master. <laughs> yes, Nicodemus, you have achieved, but understand, I know all truths. So you must come by faith. You must believe. Now notice verse 15. It's that whosoever believe in him will have eternal, uh, eternal life. At this point in time, I think Nicodemus almost fell flat on his face. Because, understand this. This is a negative answer, but it has a positive effect. Salvation will be richly provided for those who what? Believed, believe in Jesus Christ. As a result, they will get eternal life. Nicodemus' religion, did, they look at it this way because it's a work-based salvation. When you said all who believe, Jesus opened the door for you and I. Do you see yourself here? You should. The door is open for all, Jews, Gentile, anyone everywhere, every tribe, every tongue, every language. It's open to all. See, salvation will be richly provided, the everlasting life. And it begins when you believe. This salvation comes from the one who is from above. And he knows the requirements for, for living above. So what does he do? He made payment for sin once and for all, for all those who love, excuse me, for all those who love his appearing. This salvation, listen to this, this salvation will never require an upgrade be updated, revamped, or need a polishing up. This salvation is perfect. This salvation is paid in full, complete, unchanging, and God approved it by putting his stamp of approval on it by raising Jesus from the dead. Now, keep in mind, John, again, is using this expression, eternal life, 10 times in his gospel. And Jesus will be as he, Jesus will die, Jesus will be taken out of the way. Just like the scapegoat. He will die outside the camp and make propitiation for sin. Jesus will pave the way for all who believe to have eternal life. This is why this salvation is so pure and rich. So one would ask then, what is eternal life? It is to know God, John 17, 3. It is a divine quality of life. Also, it is an eternal life. It is a qu quantity of life. It is a life, it is the life everlasting. See, we begin eternal life in Christ now. And one day, we will have the full experience when our faith finally becomes sight. We will be removed from the very presence of sin because we will be like him, because we will see him. See, eternal life is the life, it has been said that eternal life is the life of God in each believer, and yet not fully manifested until the resurrection. Now, as we come to the most popular verse in the Bible, John 16, John 3, 16, someone wrote this, and I think this is appropriate. God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree the world, the greatest number that he gave, the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest invitation, believe the greatest simplicity in him, the greatest person, 
shall not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference. Have the greatest certainty, eternal life, the greatest possession. This is so appropriate. See, this familiar verse, unfortunately, is not well exposited by many. As Jesus unpacked this to Nicodemus, theological truth, he wants you to know and understand that salvation is for all people everywhere, every tribe, tongue, and language, because no one ever love as God loves, nor will anyone will. If we are his children, then we must love as well and do as he does. Because salvation is not for just a few, the proud. It's for everyone. Everyone. The guy who's the homeless who sleeps on the street, the prostitute, the homosexual. It's for everyone. The undesirables, as some might call them, the troublemakers. Yes, even the politicians. We must love them enough to pray for them and share the saving gospel of Christ with them. You can't point fingers because the very man, John, that talks about love so much, you know, whose name was called Son of Thunder, he, he was not a guy you played with. Paul was another one. He killed Christian. And guess what? When we get home, we will see them. So don't look at their past, but look at what they've done after Christ, when they came to faith in Christ. Because God loves, he gave Loves always give. Loves gives. God gave the very best heaven had to offer to a wretched, sinful, vicious, and cruel world. A world which could not comprehend the gift given. And what did they do? They killed the giver of life because their deeds were evil. And God changed the greatest good humanity. Great, changed it for the, as the best and the greatest good humanity has ever known. What is it? Eternal life and Christ. Yet through it all, God provided a salvation for undeserving sinners. Jesus showed Nicodemus that salvation was not just for the, for the few Jews only, but it was for Gentile as well. Jews and Gentile have sinned, and they all need a great Savior who is able to pay for their sin. This was a shocking moment for Nicodemus, who grew up learning that Gentiles were created to be burned in the fires of hell. Jews were the good people, and they were heaven bound no matter what they did. You know, stories told that one uh, uh, early uh, centuries writer tells the story that uh, uh, if one Jew is lost and is heading to hell, then Abraham would say, hey, 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 no, 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 you are a Jew. You, you, you can't go there. This is where you belong. He would stand there as the gatekeeper to guide the Jews in heaven. And Jesus says, uh-uh, that's not true. Jesus corrects Nicodemus theology. Everyone must be born from above. Everyone must be born again. Everyone must repent and believe, whether Jew or Gentile. This is the good news of the gospel. For all these reasons, that is why the gospel is called good news. You can be saved from all your sins. You can have all your sins forgiven. This is why it's called the present. This is why it's called today. It is a gift of God. Now is the acceptable time. This moment is the time for salvation. Nicodemus, stop running. You must repent. You must believe the gospel. Nicodemus, what will you do with Jesus? And the question goes to you as well. What will you do with Jesus? Did Nicodemus ever become a believer? Not that day, because scripture is silent. I cannot say he did. He might have, but I can't say. Scripture is silent in that. But did he become a believer? Is there biblical uh, certainty that he became a believer? Yes. I'm sorry if I'm getting excited. But yes, he became a believer. Because look, and, and as we see in John chapter 7, remember now, as the teacher in Israel, when he spoke, this decision was final. But when people want to do evil, they can throw, they will throw anyone or anyone under the bus to get to their wicked end. And John 7, 50 and 52. Nicodemus, he who came to him before. Why is John saying that? John doesn't want you to get confused. He wants you to know 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Nicodemus had become a believer by then. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> he who came to him at night, being one of them, you see now, being one of them, there's a, something, there's a detachment that begins. There's a process of leaving this group and going toward the true Messiah of God. Being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing? He posed the question. Look at their answer. They answered him, are you also from Galilee? Whoa. Search and see, this, you see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. But they were wrong. Prophets arise from Galilee. What would Nicodemus, why would Nicodemus jeopardize his career, position, and prestige for the body of a dead Jesus? In John 19, 30 and 34. And Nicodemus, who at first came to him by night. John is not going to let you forget. Also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing 75 pounds. This was expensive. He spent a ton of money so he could take care of the body of his Savior. So they looked so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen and wrappings with spices as a burial custom of the Jews. In life, he might have been a coward, but in death, he's going to be as bold as bold could be. Because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Nicodemus would be kicked out of the Sanhedrin, the synagogue, and become destitute. He was rich because the system robbed from the people, but he was rich and many, had many friends because of his faith in Christ. By grace alone to faith alone, he became a beggar. He became a beggar roaming the streets. And he died a poor man. He lost all his wealth and earthly possession in this life. And when he closed his eyes, he gained what this planet could not produce, eternal life. And he heard those words, welcome, good and faithful slave. Beloved, John, uh, James reminds us, can it all joy? I mean, no matter what we're going through, Nicodemus realized what a friend we have in Jesus. Have we trials and temptation? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Can we find a friend so faithful who will our sorrow share? Jesus knows our weaknesses. Beloved, salvation is by grace through faith and for the glory of God. If you have never repented and believed the gospel, trusted in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior today, is the acceptable time. Now is the time to run to Christ. You can have peace with God and have the peace of God. And Nicodemus did, and so can you. Bow with me in prayer. Man, please wait upon us. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you we're able to gather on this day that you have made, this last Sunday in November. Lord, we, there are many families who are traveling. Lord, we pray you will bring them home safely and grant them mercy to be rejoicing with their families and to be able to have this time of fellowship. Lord, thank you for all those who are able to come out this Sunday. Lord, be with them. You know their needs, Father. Meet us where we are. Lord, help us to continue this struggle called life. Help us to be faithful to the high calling of presenting this glorious gospel to those who do not know you. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who do not know you, Father, don't let them in here. May they come and seek more information so they can know how to meet this Savior who still have open arms and telling you to come. 
Lord, thank you for this place in which where we meet every Sunday and all those all the days of the week to do different ministries here. Lord, we pray you would be with us. Thank you for the musician how they played this morning and they worship we worship you. Thank you for all those who are working with the children in the back. Thank you, Father, for all that goes on here. Father, we pray, may we continue to proclaim your truth to those who are in need of a savior. And this small town, which has big city problem, Lord, may your salvation be proclaimed so others may come to know you as Lord and Savior. For this nation is in need of a great God, and you are, Jesus, that great God that can lead us out of this darkness of this starvation on the land for those teaching and preaching of your word. May your word be proclaimed to different means, different uh, churches as well, Lord. May people come to know you. We will praise you for the great things that you have done. Thank you for our different missionaries who support Father, be with them wherever they may be. And Lord, continue to support them, help them so they can continue to keep their faith and walk the walk and present the gospel. It's a difficult challenge where this culture is, thinks they know best. They have their own ways, their own truths, but your word is true. Your word is the word that provides a way home. Your gospel leads home because of the savior who knows the way home. And he would leave the light on for us by bringing us home. We have no other means, no other way, but we have Christ and Christ alone. So Father, we come to you rejoicing this morning, praising you for who you are. For indeed, this is the day that you have made. May we continue to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, we praise you, Father, for we ask these things. In the saving name of our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom we give glory and praise forever and ever. Amen.